Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, so many of you here uh, tonight. Uh, my name is uh, Martin Buzzer. I'm a senior lecturer in physics and astrophysics at the University of Hull. I'll, I'll make an announcement about that later. Um, <laughs> uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to chair, uh, to be the chair for tonight's uh, event uh, on behalf of the University of Hull. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture on cosmic chemistry. Do science and God mix? Uh, this talk, uh, just to give you a bit of background, this talk is part of a series of events that has been uh, organized by an informal group of Christian academics at the university who wanted to promote the university as a forum where big questions of life can be discussed in a constructive and open uh, manner. And in this context, we are absolutely delighted to have Professor John Lennox here with us uh, tonight to help us explore this fascinating and much debated topic on science and faith. Uh, John is Emeritus uh, Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University and an internationally renowned speaker on the interface between science, philosophy, and religion. He has lectured extensively in North America, Europe, and Australasia, and has debated many of the most prominent atheists of our time, including uh, Richard Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, and Peter Singer. Uh, many of these debates are, uh, in fact, available on YouTube, and you can find links to these on uh, John's, John's website, which is, uh, in fact, on the uh, screen, uh, screens behind me, uh, just by entering debate in the search, uh, search box. However, I'm sure you'll agree it's way more exciting to have John here in person with us to speak to us. So uh, thank you so much, John, for uh, uh, agreeing to come to Hull. Uh, John is a prolific uh, author, and a number of his books are on sale tonight at discounted uh, prices. A, a perennial uh, favorite is this one, The Theory of Infinite Soluble Groups, uh, a part of the uh, mathema Oxford Mathematical uh, Monographs. Uh, sadly, we don't have this book on, uh, in stock uh, at the book table. However, there are equally fabulous books uh, written uh, by John on science and faith, which are uh, on sale. So do please uh, visit the bookstall which is just outside the uh, lecture theater, uh, if you'd like to follow up anything from tonight's uh, lecture. So without further ado then, let me hand over to John to tell us about cosmic chemistry, the science and God mix. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad that Martin didn't show you the companion volume to that. <laughs> it's called The Theory of Subnormal Subgroups and routinely got classified under abnormal psychology. <laughs> but it is an honor for me to be at this university in a city of culture that well deserves the name. And it is actually the first time that I have been in the University of Hull. And thank you very much for coming. Your presence here shows me what I find all around the UK and indeed all around the world, that the question that we're looking at is indeed an important question, especially for young people. We live in an age where there are many powerful voices putting forward the idea that it is simply impossible to believe in God and remain a credible intellectual. Belief in God belongs to the days when people didn't really understand the universe and took the lazy way out and simply said that God did it. Voices like that of Steven Weinberg, Nobel Prize winner for physics, who says that the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done and may in fact be our greatest contribution to civilization. And you might just notice the rather sinister totalitarian tone. Anything we can do. I met that attitude many years ago when I was 19 at Cambridge. I was sitting at dinner and discovered to my amazement that my dinner companion was a Nobel Prize winner. I'd never met anybody of that distinction before. 
And because from my youth I have always played Socrates, finding it much easier to ask questions than answer them, I decided to find out what his science had meant to him. And in particular, I was interested what part science had played in the shaping of his worldview. That is, his answers to the big questions of existence and life. Well, when I put it that way, I could tell he was becoming just a little bit uncomfortable. And being a kind Irishman, I gave him plenty of space and changed the topic. And I thought that was the end of it. But at the end of the meal, he said, Lennox, I want you to come to my room. And he invited a couple of other senior members of the college, professors, no students, and sat me down in the chair and they stood around me. He said, Lennox, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir, I do. Well, he said, in front of witnesses tonight, give up this childish belief in God. It will cripple you. It will hold you back intellectually. You will never make it by comparison with your peers. So simply give it up. That was some pressure. I'd never known anything like it, and I was staggered by it. But eventually, I got up the courage to say, Sir, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've already got? And he came out with some form of Bergsonian philosophy, which, thanks to my interest in C.S. Lewis, I knew about. And it was highly unsuitable, as I could have demonstrated to him. But I said, if that's all you've got, I'll take the risk. And I got up and walked out. And that put resolve into my mind and heart. And I thought, if ever I get the opportunity to be in a position to raise these questions publicly, I would like to do it in a friendly, open forum. You see, if he had been a Christian and I had been an atheist, and he told me to give up my atheism, it would have been front page news in the national press in Britain the next day, and he'd probably have lost his job. So that's a little bit of my history that explains why I am passionate about opening up these questions to a wider public. And that's what I intend to do this evening. Now, the myth, and it is a myth, that is spread around is that science and God do not mix. I want to argue they mix very well, but that it is science and atheism that do not mix very well, which might be a surprise to some of you. But let's first clear up where the deep issue lies. The impression given is it science versus God, but that cannot be correct. Let's stick with the Nobel Prize for Physics. On the left-hand side is Peter Higgs, a Scotsman, the Higgs boson, of which you've all heard. On the right hand is a man of whom probably very few of you have heard, which is a tragedy because he is Ireland's only Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> he actually helped split the atom with Rutherford, so he is a man of no mean distinction. E.T.S. Walton was a Christian believer. Now, think about those two men. You see, what divides them is not their physics. They've each won the Nobel Prize. They've each reached the top. What divides them is their worldview. The one is an atheist, and the other is a Christian. And I want to suggest to you that the real question that faces our society is not whether science and God are at loggerheads, but there are two worldviews fighting for domination in our contemporary society. On the one hand, atheism or naturalism, as we often call it, and on the other hand, theism, Christian theism. And there are scientists on both sides. So the real question is, where does science fit? Does it lead, as Richard Dawkins and Stephen Weinberg would suggest, to naturalism, the idea that nature is all that exists, which is the flip side of atheism, of course? Or does it lead to the theism, or does it lead nowhere? 
And I've been impressed by the philosophical works of one of the world's most distinguished philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, who says that the alleged conflict between science and theism is superficial. There is real concord. Whereas the alleged concord between science and atheism is superficial. There is real conflict. And let me ask the question, why is it so many people think that science and God are at war? One of the reasons is the philosophy, if I could call it that, of scientism. That is the idea based on the success of science and flowing into technology that science is the only way to truth. There are many advocates of that today, including Dawkins and Weinberg and lately, and very powerfully, Stephen Hawking. And Alex Rosenberg, who's a distinguished philosopher and an atheist at Princeton, whom I debated, says being scientistic just means treating science as our exclusive guide to reality, to nature, both our own nature and everything else. Science is the only way to truth, which, of course, if you like logic, as I do, is a self-contradictory statement because the statement science is the only way to truth is not a statement of science. So if it's true, it's false. Perhaps it's too early in the evening for logic like that. So, <laughs> But this view leads to various kinds of reductionism. Nothing but Dawkins, my task is to explain elephants and the world of complex things in terms of the simple things that physicists can either understand or are working on. I'll make no comment on whether physicists think quantum electrodynamics is simple, but that's another matter. <laughs> that leads to psychological reductionism. Francis Crick, you, your joys and sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. But then there's another side that we detect among brilliant scientists. Schrodinger, the brilliant quantum physicist. I am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world around me is very deficient. And then he says, it is ghastly silent about all and sundry that is really near to our heart, that really matters to us. It cannot tell us a word about red and blue, bitter and sweet, physical pain and physical delight. It knows nothing of beautiful and ugly, good or bad, God and eternity. And then he says, science sometimes pretends to answer questions in these domains, but these answers are very often so silly that we are not inclined to take them seriously. And I am very impressed by a, an array of brilliant scientists who recognize that science is powerful precisely because it is limited. Sir Peter Medawar, who is a common hero, by the way, for both Richard Dawkins and me, the existence of a limit to science is, however, made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions having to do with first and last things Questions such as, how did everything begin? What are we all here for? What is the point of living? These why questions elude science. It's been very successful with how questions and perhaps why questions of function, but not with the why questions of purpose. But we'll bring Stephen Hawking onto the scene because he helps me focus the debate very precisely. He and Leonard Mladinov wrote a bestseller called The Grand Design, which is an interesting title because Hawking admits that he sees a grand design. He then explains it away, and he raises a lot of these questions that Medawar I've just quoted, and says, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy. But philosophy is dead, and here comes the scientism. Philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Now, Cambridge Department of Philosophy mounted almost an armed rebellion when they read that. 
philosophy is dead. And then, of course, anybody who read the book, as I did, perceived something rather odd that the entire book is about the philosophy of science. And to say at the beginning of it that philosophy is dead is rather making yourself a serious hostage to fortune. <laughs> and I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, no serious philosopher ever read that book before it was printed. Because Hawking certainly shows in it that as far as he's concerned, philosophy is dead. You know, I find Richard Feynman a very interesting physicist. He's a fascinating character. And I love this quotation. I believe that a scientist looking at problems out of their field is just as dumb as the next guy. <laughs> That's marvelously refreshing. And I need to watch it because, you know, I haven't said a word about pure mathematics tonight. Not a word. So I'm speaking outside my own professionalism. And therefore, I have to be very careful. Of course we do. And it's not wrong to do that. Everybody does it. Dawkins' books are not all about zoology. Some of them are about psychiatry, like the God delusion. So we all do it. But there are certain criteria we use to, need to use. The second thing we need to be aware of, statements by scientists are not necessarily statements of science. This is one of the big problems of public perception of the authority of science. You see, Carl Sagan, who was a wonderful communicator, started his television series, Cosmos, with the words, the universe is all that is, was, or ever shall be. That's a statement by an astrophysicist. But it's not a statement of astrophysics. It's simply a statement of his personal belief in an area where he's likely to be just as dumb as the next guy. And, and therefore, we need to beware of the real authority of scientists being abused to make statements that have nothing to do with science at all. Here's another one. Stephen Hawking, religion is a fairy story for those afraid of the dark. Now, that appeared in the Times, and they were very kind to ask me to respond to it. So I did. And I said, atheism is a fairy story for those afraid of the light. <laughs> now, you shouldn't have clapped. <laughs> and actually, there's a reason why you shouldn't have clapped. Because, you see, Hawking's statement is a statement of his belief. And so was mine. You have to justify these statements with evidence before they have any bite at all. But it's a typical Freudian response. And I find these days that it's often Freud that wins the day before people start. Richard Dawkins called his book The God Delusion. It was Freud that strongly suggested that God was an illusion, a wish fulfillment. And I meet that often, very often. And have met it all my life. Of course you believe in God, they told me at Cambridge in week one. After all, you're Irish. <laughs> and all you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. Well, I'm not sure that the historical analysis is quite accurate. But let it stand. It certainly made me think. And I thought, yes, my parents are Christians. So are my grandparents. So it's Irish genetics then. Irish DNA that has God built into the first big gene, you know? <laughs> and therefore, I decided all those years ago that I would get to know people that did not share my worldview to answer the Freudian objection. And I've been doing it ever since. And the interesting thing is this. Of course, I hadn't read much psychiatry and psychology in those days. But when I read The God Delusion, I thought this is very interesting because Dawkins is writing outside his own professional field and saying God is a delusion. And he mentions a very good definition of a delusion as a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contrary evidence. Well, that's a good definition. And then he adds correctly often in psychiatry, but he doesn't want to go down that route. And I thought this is very interesting because Dawkins is not a psychologist. 
nor am I. So what do you do? Here we are outside our field. And this is a very important test case of what I was saying earlier. What do we do now? How do we accept the authority? So I thought, right, what I shall do is see if psychiatrists agree with this. So I went to the top. The president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the United Kingdom. Does he agree with Dawkins? No. Very much not. In fact, he says that the positive beneficial effect of faith in God is the best kept secret in psychiatry. And if the results of major, not just studies, but meta-studies, epidemiological studies of studies, if the results had come out of the opposite direction and it had been found that faith in God damaged your health, it would have been front page news all around the world. And all its literature on the topic, I don't hear any of it among Dawkins. And then I noticed that some of Dawkins' atheist critics absolutely lambasted him for this because it's just factually incorrect. Now, what bothers me about that, ladies and gentlemen, here's a man who's got enormous authority, some of it rightful for the work he's done. But what is happening is the general public are being told that God is a delusion, a psychiatric category on the basis of zero evidence. And why do they buy it? Because he's got an independent authority. That bothers me intensely. And I think it's very important that we see, if you are going to use science to bury God, then you better get the science right. Otherwise, you're a charlatan. So we now go to the question of sources of evidence. How do you answer questions like this? Where does science figure in the debate between God, atheism and theism? Well, I know of no other way than asking what the evidence is. So let's look at three sources of evidence. The history of science, the nature and philosophy of science, and the results of science. The history of science is important. Indeed, history is an extremely important discipline. And modern science exploded in the 16th and 17th centuries under people like Galileo and a succession of luminaries, Kepler, Newton, and so on. And C.S. Lewis summarizing not his own work, but the work of Alfred North Whitehead, the historian philosopher, said men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Now, when I discovered that, I was fascinated. You see, what this is saying is, far from belief in God hindering science, it was the motor that drove it. And you can see the logic of it. If for you had reason to believe that this is a universe behind which there's an intelligent mind, then you might think it's worth doing science. You might find out what that mind has done. And that was the inspiration. And of course, you'll forgive me as a mathematician loving this quotation by Kepler. The chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God and which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. Well, of course, he's right. <laughs> or Isaac Newton, don't doubt the creator because it is inconceivable that accidents alone could be the controller of the universe. Or the Scottish Einstein, James Clark Maxwell, still on the door of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, now fortunately both in Latin and English. Great are the works of the Lord to be studied by all who take delight in them. Now, Let's move from there to the current situation. And perhaps the most powerful voice because of his deserved brilliance. He was just ahead of me at Cambridge and he's light years ahead of me in his mathematical ability. Stephen Hawking finally announced that he was an atheist. God did not create the universe. And I have taken great interest in his views. I've actually written a little book that you can find outside. But they focused the problem for me in a way in which I hadn't formulated it before. And it's this. Isaac Newton discovered the law of gravitation. He believed in God. And gravity was part of the evidence why he believed in God. He wrote the Principia Mathematica, 
saying at the beginning of it he hoped it would convince thinking people of the existence of a deity. Because his discovery went like this. What a brilliant God that did it that way. He didn't say, I've now got a law, I don't need God. It was, what a brilliant God did it that way, which is normally the way we react. The more you know about painting, the more you could admire the genius of a Rembrandt. Yet, Stephen Hawking, who occupied the Lucasian chair, as did Newton at Cambridge, he uses gravity as his main reason not to believe in God. Well, that's a very interesting situation. Newton, gravity for him was evidence for God, and Hawking, it's evidence that there isn't a God. Anomalies like that fascinate me. And they set me on a little quest just to answer this question. How do we get from Newton's theism to Hawking's atheism? And I want to argue that we get there by false logic false ideas about the nature of God, and false ideas about the nature of scientific explanation. So let's look at the logic first before it gets too late. Here is the central argument of the Hawking book. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. And when I read that at first, in a preview of the book, I thought, come again? Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Flat contradiction number one. Secondly, because there is a law of gravity, not because gravity exists. And I thought, now that's a very interesting thing. This is another confusion that has interested me ever since I discovered it in C.S. Lewis. The idea that law can create I once had a little spat, I suppose you should call it, with the famous Peter Atkins. I've debated him, an Oxford physical chemist. And we were just chatting. And I said, what do you think Peter created the universe? And he said, mathematics. Well, he took me aback so much that I very rudely laughed. And he was quite annoyed. And he said, what are you laughing at? Well, I said, Peter, let me be honest with you. I am a mathematician, and that must be the silliest thing I've heard for a very long time. And he said, why? Well, I said, let me put it simply, one plus one equals two. Did that ever put one, two pounds in your pocket? You know, it's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, do any of you remember the financial crisis? Do any of you remember that? Do you know, part of that was caused by people who thought that mathematics could create money. It's called creative accounting. It is a vast confusion, and Lewis pointed it out years ago. One plus one equals two will give you two pounds, provided you first find one pound plus one pound. But doing arithmetic will never create anything. Let's change the base of this. Newton's laws of motion never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. People were accused of that. The laws of motion describe what happens or at least the first few bounces, but they don't cause the motion. This is a hugely important thing. And the final thing about this marvelous sentence is the universe will create itself from nothing. Now, if I say to you, X creates Y, it roughly means that if you've got X, you'll get Y. And if I say X creates X, it roughly means if you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? Well, it means, to my mind, that nonsense remains nonsense, even if Hawking writes it. <laughs> and then will create itself from nothing. Now, this is a huge topic. I love giving lectures on nothing. <laughs> I really do. Because nothing has now become utterly fascinating to astrophysicists. They've got a huge problem because their standard model means essentially you have a beginning to space time or the multiverse or whatever. The mathematicians say you have finite this backwards in time no matter what scenario you start with. So you've got nothing. But how do you get something from nothing? Nothing comes from nothing and nothing ever could. Do you remember that little song? <laughs> well, that's basically it. And the attempts to get something from nothing are spectacularly interesting. Lawrence Krauss is one of the astrophysicists, and here's his methodology. 
Look at this. What would you do if your 12-year-old wrote this sentence? <laughs> Surely nothing is every bit as physical as something, especially if it is to be defined as the absence of something. <laughs> That's in his book, A Universe from Nothing. Now, that bothers me intellectually. That's rubbish. It's sheer nonsense. And Hawking's nothing is not nothing. But I get fortunate sometimes. I get to really go to the horse's mouth. And I was asked to do, uh, well, it was called a debate at the Harvard MIT Faculty Club. Now, that's a pretty formidable arena at about 200 professors in the audience. And I was asked to debate the father of inflation, of modern cosmology, Alan Guth, who was a very nice chap. And I decided, unusually, that I would ask the first question when he finished. I said, Alan, you know, there's, people are confused about nothing out there in public. In fact, there's much ado about nothing. And uh, <laughs> I said, look, when you astrophysicists use the word nothing, you don't mean what all the rest of us mean as absence of anything. He said, no, we do not. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, they have not solved the intellectual problem of a universe from nothing. You see, as a Christian, if I might just say something, because it's relevant, I believe the universe came from nothing physical. I do not believe it came from nothing. God is spirit, he's not nothing. And the fundamental stuff of the universe is not physical anyway, but we'll come to that in a moment. So, false logic. And by the way, here's a challenge if you can't sleep tonight. Write for me a sentence that sounds brilliantly scientific, that's got at least three levels of self-contradiction in it. And I would love to read it, because I can't invent one myself. But Hawking has done it very successfully. <laughs> The next problem is, what God are we talking about? I was young once in Ireland, and when I used the word God then, everybody thought I was talking about the eternal God of the Bible. But not now, of course. And it took me a long time to see that the culture had changed. That when I spoke about God in public, People thought I was talking about someone like the Greek god of lightning. Now, Greek gods of lightning or thunder or anything else are gods that disappear on scientific advance. If you go to the first few lectures in atmospheric physics in this university, you will close the book on the god of lightning or thunder. This is a god of the gaps, crudely put, I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now, I want you to grasp a bit of logic, which is very important. If that's how you think of God, if you define God to be like that, to be the explanation for what science has not yet explained, then you have to choose between God and science as a matter of logic. That's the way you've defined God, to be that X which science has not yet explained. And that revealed why, to me, that I couldn't understand why Hawking says to students and professors alike, you must choose between science and God. It's because he's got a false concept of God. You see, the God of the Bible is the God, not of the gaps, but of the whole shoe. If you've ever read page one of the Bible, I hope you've at least got to page one. <laughs> You've noticed it starts with a statement, in the beginning, God created the bits of the universe we don't yet understand. <laughs> it doesn't. But that is exactly the approach that's being adopted. You see, the God of the Bible is the God of the whole show. He's the creator of the bits we do understand and the bits we don't understand. And it's the bits that Newton did understand that provided evidence of God's intelligence behind the universe and the famous statements at the beginning of Genesis and of John, existence statements. In the beginning was the word, all things came to be through him and without him nothing came to be that came to be. We'll move on to the third one, false ideas about the nature of scientific explanation because very often 
The argument is, we have a law, it explains this, or we have a mechanism, it explains that. Therefore, God is unnecessary. Well, let's stick with gravity. What does the law of gravity explain? Well, I used to think it explained gravity. But it doesn't, you know. Nobody even today knows what gravity is. And I've asked many physicists the question. You see, we feel that if you've got a law, it is a comprehensive explanation. In science, it very rarely is. The law of gravity gives you a brilliant mathematical way of calculating the interaction between, say, two heavy bodies, and you can land somebody on the moon with it. But as Newton himself explicitly said, he had no hypothesis to explain what it is. So the law of gravity doesn't explain gravity. And if you like Wittgenstein, it's a long name and it's nice to quote, but Wittgenstein <laughs> made a very incisive statement years ago. The great delusion of modernity is that the laws of nature explain the universe for us. The laws of nature describe the universe. They describe the regularities, but they explain nothing. That's worth thinking about. Science explains, but what does it explain? Well, let's look at another simple example. Why is the water boiling? Well, because the heat from the Bunsen flame is being conducted through the base of the kettle, is agitating the molecules of water, and that's why it's boiling. Well, yes, but it's boiling because I want a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> that's very simple, isn't it? I wish I could get people to see the implication of that. Those are two explanations of a single phenomenon. The one is scientific, and the other is personal in terms of my volition, desire. It's an agent explanation. Which of them is the necessary explanation? Well, you say they're both necessary. Of course they are. You need both to give a comprehensive explanation. Now, here's what scientism does. It says, no, you only need one, which is nonsense in most cases. And it's so obvious that these explanations don't compete, they don't conflict, they complement, and they're both necessary. And, funnily enough, the personal explanation is generally more important than the scientific. I mean, after all, people have been enjoying tea for thousands of years before they do anything about heat transfer. Now, if we want to extrapolate, this is a very simple piece of elementary logic. Let's uh, extrapolate a bit. Put it this way, Newton's law of gravitation no more competes with God as an explanation of the universe, then the law of internal combustion competes with Henry Ford as an explanation of the motor car. Do you get that? You need both. Now, explanation is one of the most interesting things to me. And we need to move on from it because there is a view around, held by Dawkins and mentioned in his book, that real explanation must start with simple things and go to complex things. You explain water in terms of hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. And using God, he says, as an explanation is just absurd, since God is by definition more complex than the thing you are explaining. That sounds impressive until you apply it to his own book, which I did. The God delusion is quite complex. It's about 400 pages. And I asked, what is behind this book? What is the explanation? And somebody came along and said to me, actually, the explanation is to be found in the infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins. I said, that cannot be true, because Dawkins himself says that an explanation cannot be more complex than the thing you're explaining. So it can't be that. This is nonsense, ladies and gentlemen, once more. And it is dangerous nonsense. Because what it's flagging up is there is one area of intellectual activity where explanation does not go from the simple to the complex. And that is where language is involved. You're looking at words on the screen at this moment. You know that whatever processes, natural, contrived or otherwise, lie behind those words, there's a mind behind them because they have meaning for you. 
And we need to follow that because it's a very important idea. Now, if you've heard this story before, go to sleep for two minutes. <laughs> but at least it has the advantage of explaining things quite clearly. We have lovely dinners in my college at Oxford. And the trouble is with them, you can't choose where you sit. That's usually very interesting because you meet new people. But one night, I was put beside a brilliant biochemist. And he unfortunately asked me what I did, not who I was. That's a much more interesting question. But what I did, I said pure mathematics. And he said, how dreadfully boring. <laughs> so OK. And I tried to soften the thing because he wasn't from my college. And I said, well, you know, I tried to make up for the social ineptitude of my subject by being interested in the big questions. He said, what big questions? I said, like the status of the universe, for instance. Is it created or not? Or, oh, he said, it's far worse than I thought. <laughs> he said, listen, I'm an atheist. I'm a reductionist. We've nothing to talk about. And we're going to have a thoroughly miserable dinner. Well, that was a challenge. <laughs> so I looked at him, and I said, you're a reductionist. I said, that's very interesting. He said, why? Well, I said, I know at least three different kinds of reductionism. Which kind are you? <laughs> so a bit of hesitation and a bit of help. But anyway, he said, yes, I, we split big problems into little problems and analyze the little problems and get insight on the big problems. Well, I said, I do that. It's methodological reductionism. So we have something to talk about. But he said, I don't mean that. I said, I know you don't mean that. But at least we've got something in common. I said, you are an ontological reductionist. Ontos, Greek for being. You believe that everything can be reduced to physics and chemistry. He said, that's exactly right. So I said, good, that is very interesting. Would you like to do an experiment? He said, what? At the dinner table, I said, sure, this is Oxford. <laughs> so he said, what's the experiment? So I gave him the menu from the table. And he read the second line, roast chicken. I said, how do you know? Well, he said, it says roast chicken. <laughs> I said, I see some marks on paper. Uh, five um, marks, R-O-A-S-T. He said, that's roast. I said, how do you know? <laughs> he said, what's your problem? I said, none whatsoever, but you've got a problem. <laughs> he said, what is my problem? I said, you're a reductionist. Yes, everything in terms of physics and chemistry, yes. OK, I said, explain how those marks, R-O-A-S-T, carry meaning. And your explanation can only involve the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And his wife was sitting there. She was a nice lady. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because she suddenly said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> he didn't try. He said, you know, John, he'd become friendly now, as I knew he might. <laughs> For 40 years, I'd gone into my lab. Now, this is a world-class scientist leading one of the biggest labs in the world. For 40 years, I've gone into my lab thinking that could be done. I was absolutely stunned at his honesty. But he says, it can't. I said, why not? Because you need a mind to complete the explanation. Oh, but I said, physics and chemistry have only been going. I played devil's advocate, which I do very easily. <laughs> and uh, he said, doesn't matter. You need a mind. And then he looked at me. He said, where did you get that argument? Oh, I said, don't worry. I got it from a Nobel Prize winner. Oh, I said, what a relief. <laughs> but then came this thing. I said, you work on DNA, don't you? He said, yes. It's an information-bearing macromolecule. It's longer than R-O-A-S-T. It's a word of three and a half billion letters. Now I said to him, what about that. Oh, he says, chance and necessity. I said, what? Are you ascribing its origin exclusively to chance and the laws of the nature? He said, yes. And yet you saw R-O-A-S-T. And you told me, because that bears meaning, there's a mind behind it. There's something going wrong. And there is, ladies and gentlemen. There is something going wrong at the heart of science which has yielded up to us the fact 
that every one of the 10 trillion cells in our bodies carries the longest word we've ever seen, which carries meaning. It codes for the um, genes and so on. And the interesting thing is this. What is behind a lot of the philosophy pushed forward by the so-called new atheists is not only naturalism, it is materialism. It is that the ultimate stuff in the universe, ultimate reality is material. But that cannot be true. Not now in contemporary science, because we have lived to enter the information age. And information, of course, though carried on material, is not itself material. It is one of the supreme ironies of contemporary science that it is now talking about information as a fundamental quantity that is irreducible to physics and chemistry. And of course, that brings you right back to the idea of mind. And Anthony Flew, who was Richard Dawkins' predecessor as the world's most famous atheist, I got to know him just before he died. Research into DNA, here was his response had shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved. I have been persuaded that it is simply out of the question that the first living matter evolved out of dead matter and then developed into an extraordinarily complicated creature. But to close now, ladies and gentlemen, Let us come to an idea that is not often discussed. The word faith is much misunderstood in our society. It is regarded as a religious word, and it means believing where there's no evidence. Both of those definitions are completely false and dangerously false. Faith is an ordinary word. It means trust, reliability, and normally, if we've got any sense at all, we expect evidence to be behind it. If you don't believe that, go and ask your bank manager for a £100,000 loan tomorrow and see if he asks for any evidence to trust you. So let's think about thinking that clever people like Einstein, who were amazed at the fact that the universe was intelligible. And he said himself that he couldn't conceive of a genuine scientist without that faith. All scientists are people of faith, not in God, of course, necessarily, but in the intelligibility of the universe. You cannot do any physics, chemistry, or anything, any science, without believing it can be done. You've got to have a credo, a faith commitment. And, of course, many others, like Eugen Wigner, mentioned this, and perhaps I should quote my teacher of quantum mechanics at Cambridge, Sir John Polkinghorne, physics is powerless to explain its fundamental belief in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe. But why should we believe that? And here's another little thing I like doing at dinner tables. In conversations, I will ask some scientist, what do you do science with? And they proudly tell me of the latest billion dollar machine that they've been awarded and all. I said, no, 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 no. Oh, you mean my, and they're about to say mind when they remember it's not politically correct to believe in the mind. And so they say the brain. Uh, I do believe the mind and brain are different, but that's something else. So I say, okay, the brain. Tell me about the brain. Give me the short history, a brief history of the brain. Okay, the brain is the end result of an unguided natural series of processes. And I look at them and say, and you trust it. <laughs> now I say, just, just a moment. If you knew that the computer you use every day was the end product of a series of unguided natural processes, would you trust it? I've never had the answer yes to that. Never. Therefore, I said, your faith in your brain is on very, very shaky ground. Now, often at this point, they asked me where I got the argument, and I said, you'd be very surprised. Charles Darwin, no less. 
With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. And this question is now in the center of the debate. Planting a, again, if Dawkins is right that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own atheism. And so it goes on. But the most interesting thing is there is at least one leading and very powerful atheist in America, Thomas Nagel who has written an explosive book. Now, he's a hard atheist. He doesn't want there to be a God, and he's written so. His book is entitled Mind and Cosmos, Why the Neo-Darwinian View of the World is Almost Certainly False. It's caused an absolute uproar, as you can see, if you Google it. But here's his argument, and it's the same as Darwin's doubt. If the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends, and so on, and so forth. And C.S. Lewis got it right in the 1940s. Unless human reasoning is valid, no science can be true. If ultimate reality is not material, not to take this into account in our context is to neglect the most important fact of all. Yet the supernatural dimension has not only been forgotten, it has been ruled out of court by many. The naturalists have been engaged in thinking about nature. They have not attended to the fact that they have been thinking. The moment one attends to this, it is obvious that one's own thinking cannot be merely a natural event. And therefore, mark these words, something other than nature exists. What Lewis is saying is very profound. That evidence of the supernatural resides in every person's mind. You don't have to start talking about the miracles of the New Testament to get evidence for the supernatural. So my conclusion is simple. Do science and God mix? Yes, very well. But science and atheism do not mix because atheism logically leads to doubt about the validity of the rational processes needed to do science. And so a final comment about our worldviews, you see. Because the polarization, interesting, fascinating. I never thought we'd get to this. It's God or nothing. Literally, God or nothing. The universe from nothing or God creating it. And of course, the challenge is which makes most sense? Is it more sensible to think that there's mind behind the mathematical structures of the universe, the law-like behavior of the universe, the mathematical describability of that law-like behavior, and the genetical... Uh, uh, the genetical descriptor in terms of, of words, doesn't that make much more sense with the explanation in the beginning was the word? All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be that came to be. Now this is part one of the lecture, ladies and gentlemen. Part one of another very much longer lecture, which I'm not going to give. But perhaps you will see now, if there's anything in what I've been saying tonight that enables us to open our minds, first of all, to the existence of something beyond nature, not something spooky, but something that's demonstrated by our rational capacities and leads us to the idea that there's a rational mind behind the universe. And that prepares the way for something infinitely bigger. The word became human and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. What about that bit? If the first bit's right, it adds enormous credibility to the second bit. But that would be a story for another time. Thank you very much.